Thank you all. Welcome, everybody. What a wonderful, packed audience. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this session. I don't think I would ever have imagined that I would be sitting on a platform with Avi Shleim and Shlomo San together. Um, so I feel it's quite a historic event. Um, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that these are two uh, extraordinarily original, bold, and brave thinkers who have made it something of their life's work to work against the grain of dominant historical narratives and whereas that's something of a kind of uh, cliche in many areas of <coughs> academic study in the context of the conflict in Israel-Palestine, the notion of writing against the grain, working against the grain has a whole other set of resonances and meanings. Just briefly to introduce Avi Schleim first, whose book Collusion Across the Jordan of 1988 I think could be fa fairly described as the first foray into the new history of which he was in fact one of the founding um, and seminal creators. Most recently the author of an extraordinary biography of King Hussein of Jordan, perhaps most famous for his book The Iron Wall of 2000, um, which systematically undid a whole strand of Zionist thinking. Uh, which made Israel the innocent victim of an aggressive and hostile Arab world that had never accepted its existence and more or less on his own, I would say, although he will insist there were other historians involved, turned that narrative on its head by showing the obduracy and intransigence with which Israel had systematically blocked possibilities of peace since its inception in 1948. Uh, Shlomo Sand has burst onto the scene, onto our scene, uh, intellectual scene this year. But he has for a number of years now been quietly, or I should perhaps say not quite so quietly, working on the problem of the intellectual. I hope that's fair, Shoma, which I think has been a preoccupation for you in some way, and what might be called the, the trahison des clercs, the betrayals of the intellectuals. And one of his best known books in France is called Les Mots et les Terres, and it's about the Israeli intellectual, which I think laid the groundwork for the book that we will be discussing. Yeah. We will be discussing this evening. Now, um, if Avi is an archivist, let's say in his more modest moments, he will say all he does is go to the archive and find out what happens and report back. That is a modest and not totally fair description of the, 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 the extraordinary force and impact of what he does, but it's his method. Shlomo is more a historian of the historians. Let's say he's more interested not so much in the making of history as in the writing of history, although I would think on the basis of reading both their works together that, that distinction somewhat crumbles. I say the making of history and the writing of history turn out to be deeply, deeply imbricated in each other. Um, a few weeks ago I was at a conference on what's called psychoactive work in Israel-Palestine organized by Lynn Siegel of Birkbeck which was about work across the boundary between Israel and Palestine on the repercussions and after effects psychically of the trauma of the conflict. And one of the panels that I was privileged to be on myself was about acknowledgement and denial. And in a sense, I feel that both the work of Avi and Shlomo is about the problem of denial. That's to say, a story that Israel cannot bear to tell about itself, um, and how central to Israel's self-fashioning is the need to create what Shlomo describes as a mythic history, and which I think Avi in his own way would go along with as well. Um, they both um, end up on notes of strange optimism come pessimism, which um, I'm sure we will come to later. Um, Avi ends his book, uh, the preface to his new book, by saying, I draw comfort from the fact that nations can behave rationally after they have exhausted all the other options. <laughs> Which is a wonderful quote about national <coughs> behavior. And uh, Shlomo ends his book by saying, why not put forth a similarly lavish effort of the imagination to create a different tomorrow? If the nation's history was mainly a dream, why not begin to dream its future afresh before it becomes a nightmare? And I think those two moments in their writing gives an, an indication of the incredible power
passionate investment they both have in their work and their sense that a great deal hangs on what can and cannot be known about this conflict and its history. I've said something about Avi's work on the Zionist narrative, just to pick out two things from Shlomo's book. The argument about expulsion, was there an expulsion in 70 CE? And the argument about conversion, were, are the Jewish people as they consider themselves to be today very often the descendants of converted Jews. To say that these two arguments throw a spanner into the works, I think, is to venture something of an understatement. Um, in a way, reading Shlomo's book, it made me understand for the first time the notion of the domino effect. Because every time he knocks down one thesis, like expulsion, then the next one, conversion or purity of the nation falls, and then gradually the whole notion of what constitutes a people starts to crumble before your eyes. And I do want you to buy both these books, but I should say that, sh <laughs> that Shlomo's book, in a sense, all you need, I don't mean this, is the title, right? <laughs> the invention, <laughs> the invention of the Jewish people. I mean, this is such a shocking thing to say. You can just, as it were, pause on that. This is my way of saying that both these writers are, I think I would say, scandalous thinkers in their way. Um, and I think that is a huge, for me, that is a huge praise. So I'm delighted to introduce them this evening. And the format of the evening will be that <laughs> Avi will speak first for 10 minutes, then Shlomo will speak for 10 minutes, then I will engage them in conversation for 20 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to you because, of course, we want to hear from you as much as possible. Okay, so Avi, if you would like to start. Good evening, and thank you all for coming to this uh, conversation. And thank you, Jacqueline, for your introduction. It was, at least in my case, um, generous beyond honesty. Um, and I only wish that my mother had been here <laughs> to hear all this praise. And uh, I'm going to come back to my mother. But first, I'd like to pay tribute to Jacqueline as a, a wonderful friend and a very distinguished scholar and a very talented and inspiring um, teacher. Uh, Jacqueline also introduced me to the notion of a public conversation. I was a conventional lecturer. And um, <coughs> this happened about five years ago when Jacqueline published a book, The Question of Zion. And I invited her to come and give a lecture about her book at the Middle East Center at St. Anthony's College, where I'm a fellow. And Jacqueline refused point blank to give a lecture. She said, I, I will come, but only on condition that we will have a conversation uh, as equals. And this was a new idea to me. Uh, only in Oxford would this <laughs> be a new idea. <laughs> so I thought I'll get round it. And uh, I advertised the event, and I thought I would introduce her, and um, then I'll ask her a question, and then she'll speak for half an hour. So I introduced her. I said, to those of, her, those of you who don't know us, I am Avi Schlein, and this is Jacqueline Rose. Uh, and um, before I knew where I was, it was Jacqueline who was cross-examining me. I was on the psychiatrist's couch. <laughs> she asked me relentless questions about my childhood in Baghdad, my relations with my father, my relations <laughs> with my mother. And I should have said to her, um, Oedipus Schmidipus, what does it matter as long as he loves his mother? <laughs> but, but I didn't. I dutifully answered all her questions, and we had um, an interesting conversation. And the student said to me afterwards, this was the best event of the year because there wasn't a lecture. <laughs> Uh, Jacqueline and I uh, are colleagues in various forums, like Independent Jewish Voices and um, Jews for Justice for Palestinians, which um, Melanie Phillips calls Jews for Genocide. <laughs> and <laughs> Jacqueline and I were involved in a public debate organized by Intelligence Squared on the motion 
uh, Zionism today is the real enemy of the Jews. And Jacqueline and I spoke for the motion, and um, Melanie Phillips and others spoke against the motion. And astonishingly, we won the debate. Uh, uh, and Melanie Phillips wasn't too pleased, and she wrote the most vitriolic <laughs> blog about us, and she said that uh, listening to Jacqueline Rose and Avi Schleim speak about Israel is like listening to pedophiles. And you know, uh, English is my third language. My first language is Arabic, and my second language is Hebrew. So I thought she said, we are pediatricians. <laughs> So this was okay with me, and, and because in fact I am a doctor, um, but I don't specialize in children, I specialize in crazy states. Uh, everything to do with Israel is controversial, so let me begin by stating where I stand. I've never questioned the legitimacy of the state of Israel within its pre-1967 borders. What I question, what I challenge, what I reject utterly and totally and uncompromisingly is the Zionist colonial project beyond the 1967 borders. And I'm sometimes described as a new historian or a revisionist Israeli historian. I belong to a very small group of new Israeli historians, but I'm very, very glad to say that our numbers are not depleted. There is Ilan Pape, and there is now Thank Shlomo you. Sand, who has joined um, the club. We are called um, new historians because we challenge a standard Zionist version about the origins, the causes, and the course of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We assign a far higher degree of responsibility to Israel for initiating and for escalating this conflict and for blocking the path to a peaceful settlement of the conflict. My main gripe against the old historians, against the um, Zionist and pro-Zionist historians, is that they write a nationalist version of history. And every um, nationalist version of history is distorted. It's simplistic, selective, and above all, self-serving. And Zionist historiography is no different to every, any other nationalist version of history. One definition of a nation is a group of people united by hatred of their neighbors and a mistaken view of their past. This uh, definition is attributed to Ernest Renan, the 19th century French thinker, but he never said that. What, he did, what Renan did say is that getting its history wrong is part of being a nation. Um, it's striking to note how often we use the phrase to forge a nation, because most nations are forgeries. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where Shlomo's book comes in. It's called The Invention of the Jewish People. Invention of the Jewish People is just mildly uh, more respectful than the forging of the Jewish people. <laughs> I am a great believer in the subversive purpose of history, <clears throat> in challenging accepted notions, making people think again about their past. Nikita Khrushchev once said, historians are terrible people. They are capable of up upsetting everything. <laughs> and may they long continue to upset uh, everything, to challenge the received wisdom, to challenge um, the official version. And the official and semi-official version of the, Israel, of the Zionist uh, Arab conflict is very little more than the propaganda of the victors. And another way in which I differ from conventional historians, Israeli historians, is that I'm interested not just in the Israeli side, 
but also in the victims, the Palestinians in this case. So for me, writing history is writing the history not just of the, the victors, but also of the victims. Uh, many, many years ago, there was an article in The Times, uh, no doubt by its hunting correspondent. In those days, it had one. And the title of the article was A Good Season for Partridge. <laughs> but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a good season for partridge, because the partridge were at the receiving end. <laughs> So the title was a misnomer, and it reminds me of my favorite uh, uh, newspaper title, which was A Chinese General Flies Back to Front. <laughs> uh, I do not wish to deny that the Jews are also victims. The Jews in the history have suffered a lot. The American Jewish historian Salo Baron, who features very prominently in your book, coined the phrase, the lacrimose version of Jewish history. That is, Jewish history is a never-ending chain of suffering and persecution and discrimination culminating in the Holocaust. And I do not deny that this is uh, a valid um, summary of Jewish history. What I deny is that the lacrimose version applies to Israel after 1948. It applies to the Jews up to 1948, mm -hmm. but after 1948, after the creation of the State of Israel, the boot was on the other shoe, and the, Jew, the Israelis ceased to be uh, the victims. My book, um, Israel and Palestine, Reappraisals, Revisions, and Refutations, is a collection of essays that I have written at different times over the last 20 or 25 years and uh, at different, different um, places. But what all of these disparate pieces have in common is that they represent an attempt at an alternative approach to this conflict, an alternative uh, way of trying to understand the nature and dynamics of this um, conflict. The um, three main subheadings, three main turning points in the Arab-Israeli conflict and in the, in the volume. 1948, or well, I should say that the volume covers chronologically 1917 to 2009. The Balfour Declaration of 1917 up to the Gaza War of December 2008. The first turning point um, is 1948, and the initial debate between the old and the new historians focused on the first Arab-Israeli war and the creation of the State of Israel. <coughs> and our work, our joint work, Benny, uh, um, Benny Morris, Ilan Pape, Simcha Flappen, and myself, amounted to a frontal assault on all the myths that surrounded the birth of Israel. And I'm not going to go into the bones of three contention. More three more minutes. <laughs> um, so I'll sum up by saying that I did write an article on the debate about 1948. And my wife, who is here, Gwyn, who is my severest <laughs> critic, read it. And she said it was quite mature, uh, <laughs> unlike me and unlike the rest of my work. <laughs> Um, I'll just sum up the debate on 48. The old historians say that we charge Israel with original sin. I think that Christian theology is not relevant to this particular dispute, but since they introduced it, I would reply that it is they, the old historians, who in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, still cling to the doctrine of Israel's immaculate conception. <laughs> uh, the second turning point was the June 1967 war, and I believe that it was a defensive war, not an expansionist war. Yet, for the first time in the aftermath of the war, Israel had something to offer the Arabs in return for peace. There was UN Resolution 242, and Israel could offer land for peace. When it did so with Egypt, 
it received a peace treaty. When it did so with Jordan in 1944, there was an Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. Um, in relation to the West Bank, Israel had two options, the Jordanian option, a peace agreement with King Hussein, and Israel did not take it up, and um, a Palestinian option, an agreement with the local leaders, the West Bank leaders who wanted a peace settlement uh, with Israel. So since 1967, the, the choice for Israel was land or peace. It could have land or it could have peace. It couldn't have both. And the third turning point was the Oslo Accord of 1993 and its aftermath. The big question is, why did the Oslo Accords, why did the Oslo peace process break down? Mm -hmm. And the official Israeli answer is because the Palestinians returned to violence. And my reply is that the, the Os Oslo Accord was a modest step in the right direction. It broke down because Israel, under the leadership of the Likud, Israel, after the election of Benjamin Netanyahu in 1996, um, reneged on its side of the deal. And I can be more specific. In one word, the reason for the collapse of the Oslo peace process was settlements, Jewish settlements on the West Bank. Because you cannot claim to be going forward towards a political solution with the Palestinians and at the same time be stealing more and more of their land. Land grabbing does not go hand in hand with um, peacemaking. It's one or the other, and Israel, not by its rhetoric, by its actions since 1967, has opted for land, land grabbing. This is where we are today, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. It's my turn now. In 10 minutes, I think that I will not arrive to resume my book to save you money, not to buy, to buy it, you see? It will be very, very difficult uh, to, to, to expose all my book, okay? But I will try a little bit for the people that don't want to buy and next <laughs> the book, okay? Now, this week, it's the first time that I'm lecturing uh, really in English. It's not my la first language, not my second language, not my third language, it's the fourth language. Then I, I am really, really excused that I am going to make a few mistakes in speaking a terrible English language, okay? But I will try to be clear. This week I was interviewed about my book by an uh, English uh, journalist. And a few of them asked me how brave I am by writing this book and living in Israel. First of all, I'm not so brave because I waited to the full professorship to write the book. <laughs> no, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. It's, you know, when the guy started to discuss the problem of the Nakba of the 48, I didn't feel uh, concerned because, you know, my field was Europe. My field was uh, the political culture in France and all this because I'm living in a very, very strange university. I'm, not, I'm teaching history, but th there is not history department in Israel, you know. In any university, there is not, it didn't exist a history department. There is general history department that I belong, and there is Jewish historical department. I cannot write, teach about Jewish history because I belong to the general history department. And I was afraid, you know, it's not so simple to start to write about Jew in, uh, in the Tel Aviv University. I waited, you know, the discussion about 48 was very important, very important, very shocking. But it's, in some way it's finished because a lot of people started to say, okay, okay, we were not right. Uh, it was a crime, 48. But you know, every state, the birth of every nation started with crimes. It was our right to come back to our homeland after 2,000 years. Now, I decided to attack exactly this logic, this myth of the return, 
by writing this book about the invention. By the way, the, the title is not provocative. I think that the Jewish people was invented in the 19th century, like a lot of other people, like the French people, Italian people, German people. And after it, in the 20th uh, century, a lot of other people were, were invented, by the way, also the Palestinian people. Then I decided to write this book. And now, I will not uh, try to really to explain what I tried to, to do in it, but I, uh, maybe I will uh, tell you a little bit about the reception, because it's very interesting from political and historical point of view. The reception of my book in Israel. I'm writing everything in Hebrew firstly, and after it I translated it to French, and after it to English and other languages, okay? <coughs> then I wrote everything, especially about Israel, or Jewish people, or Jewish non-people, in Hebrew. Publishing the book, I was afraid. I knew that I'm going to lose a few good friends. You have to understand. They accept my political uh, positions. I always was uh, against the occupied territories. I participated in a lot of manifestation. My colleague was very happy that I exist as a political person. But one thing was important, not to touch Jewish history. Then I decided to write this book. It was published in uh, the first mistake. There is a few mistakes in my book, you have to know, like every book, OK? <coughs> the first mistake in my book that I, I was written, I, I wrote there that uh, a few people will, are going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, <laughs> you will see. I kept, by the way, this mistake in the English translation. Then I wrote a few people, and suddenly it became a bestseller in Israel for a few months. And I was astonished. I, really, I didn't understand what happened. Now, the media, to show you that you are a very liberal state, the media invited me more and more again and again to speak about my book. Now, uh, a lot of people bought the book, a lot of students in Tel Aviv especially bought the book because, you see, they, they didn't need an uh, historical excuse, a mythical excuse to explain why they are living in the Middle East. You understand? It, for them, it was much not natural to continue to live in the Middle East without this Zionist myth. This is one of the reasons that it's become a bestseller. Now, uh, if you are opening the internet, uh, you will discover a few attacks, very, very aggressive attacks, from whom? For the official Zionist historians in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And they are right, attacking me, they are right, because I, all my book, all my book, I show how, how, how serious they are, you understand? I'm covering my book. My book is not about the uh, history of the Jew. My book is the, the way that historians constructed the history of the Jew. And I blame them not to write history, but to write myth. By the way, it's very important to build a nation to create myth. But in some moment, the myth started to disturb the life. Now, the ethnic myth of the Jewish people is so strong, was so strong in the last century that I felt the duty to try to, to con deconstruct it to continue to live in the Middle Age. I didn't hide the fact that the motivation to write the book were historiographic motivation, also political motivation. About the historical motivation, it's very clear. I applied to the Jewish history the same thing that was applied to the French history before me, to the Italian history before me, and even the British history before me. I mean that I applied a lot of discoveries that uh, were developed, uh, especially in Britain, by Ernest Gellner, Benedict Anderson, and a lot of others. I applied to the Jewish history simply. By the way, there is nothing new in my book, really. And my critics were right, saying 
Nothing, we know everything that you wrote and everything is wrong. <laughs> this is the first argument. We know everything and everything is wrong. If they are right in the first part of the sentence. I took a lot of things and I organized the knowledge, the historical knowledge differently. This is the only thing that I did in my book. Nothing original. 60 years ago, a lot of people knew the same thing that I tried to explain in the book. 100 years ago, and much more people <coughs> knew the Jewishness was a very great religion in history, but not really a people in the modern sense of the word people. And this is the thing that I tried to, to show in this book. Now, the reception of the historians were very, very bad, and they continue to be very bad. You see, when I work in the in the Tel Aviv University, a lot of ex-friends cannot look at my, in my eyes. I mean, I touch something, a raison d'etre in the Middle East. Raison d'etre, you know more, a little bit? Yes. Being there, they need a justification of historical rights. And I deconstructed the historical rights. By the way, I didn't believe before in the historical rights of the Jewish on Palestine. I remember the time that I believed that the Jewish people exist. I was sure, uh, quite sure that the Jewish people existed for 5,000 years. I remember 10 years ago. But in that time, I put a question. Why uh, historical rights? Why somebody that leave a place 2,000 years ago has a right to return, and somebody is living there 1,000 years has not a right? Later, really, in the last 10 years, I started to think, what is the meaning of a Jewish people? Why there is a historical right about this land? And this is my book. I try to explain that most of the Jew are not descendant of the old Hebrew. You see, like you are not exactly the descendant of the Saxon. You know it? <laughs> Maybe some of you, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the chance, I don't believe, by the way, even if, you know, I'm uh, in one subtitle uh, chapter, I'm writing ab about the fact that uh, the first Zionists believe that the Arab peasant in place in the beginning of the 20th century, David Ben-Gurion, was sure that Palestinians are the direct descendant of the old Hebrew. I don't believe in it. But I think that the chance that uh, a member of Hamas in Hebron will be much more nearer genetically to the old Hebrew than me and Avi Schlein. I don't know about Jacqueline Ross. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't care if I'm uh, genetically uh, near or far. I don't care, really. Shlomo, it's not roots. Two more minutes. I'm finishing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about the roots. I care about the future. I'm living in a, a society in a state that in this form, in this politics, has not a future to continue to exist. Because all this myth history, as I use the word myth history, serves in Israel to keep an ethnocratic society and not a democratic society. And this is was one of the most important in my book. To save the existence of Israel, and I agree more or less politically with Avich Schlein, I mean, uh, we have to accept the product of the Zionist project, I mean the Israeli society, because Zionism creates the Israeli nation or Israeli people. If I'm a, I'm a denial of the Jewish people, I think that Zionism is a denial of the Israeli people. You understand me? To save this, uh, you know, this society, the only way is to make it a democratic society. I mean a society of its citizens and not a, a state of the Jewish in the world. I imagine that I'm sitting here before a people that some of you define themselves as a the Jew, no? I, I imagine. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think that Israel has 
to continue to be a society of Jews that don't want to live there. And most of the Jews in the world don't want to live in Israel. I'm right, no? Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a wonderful moment towards the end of Shlomo's book where he says something which I think is very relevant. Speak up. Sorry. There's a one you hear me now? Yeah. There's a wonderful moment towards the end of Shlomo's book where he says something which I think is very, very relevant to diaspora jury where he says one of the things that Israel cannot bear to acknowledge is that there may be Jews in the world who are fully and deeply concerned about the fate of other Jews without necessarily, or in fact, precisely without wanting to share a national home and identity with Jewish people. And that it is crucial to drive a wedge between those two concepts of what it means to be Jewish. That's just to pick up something that he just said. However, I have one or two questions. I know time is passing very quickly, but I'm going to put my first question to Shlomo and Avi is about the tension in their thinking between 1948 and 1967. Um, I think it's... Sorry? Is it not working? Oh. Is it working now? Yes. The tension between 48 and 67. Okay, but let me explain what I mean, oh. which is that both of you say, well, certainly Avi has always said that he recognizes the legitimacy, the legal legitimacy of Israel, not the ethical legitimacy necessarily. It's more complex. Um, but that legally Israel was given the right to exist by the 1947 UN partition plan. But his problem is with 67 and the expansion beyond those original armistice lines and borders. On the other hand, Avi, in your work, as you say, the one exception to the 1948 date in your new book is your wonderful essay on the Balfour Declaration. You go back to 1917, where, as you point out, Weizmann's interest in negotiating over Palestine was entirely a matter for the British and the Jews. The Palestinians and the Arabs had absolutely nothing to do with it. It is the central contention of your, the Iron Wall that Jabotinsky's 1923 articles on the Iron Wall, in which he said the only chance of peace in the future is to go nowhere towards any possibility of peace in the present. That's to say that you have been the historian, in a way, who tracks back to way before even 1948 what was wrong. Okay. <coughs> also, in your recent wonderful article on the Gaza Offensive, in 2008, 2009, you were happy to start by quoting uh, Troutbeck, I think it was, who wrote to Ernest Bevan in 1948 and said, this is a gangster state ruled by a set of utterly unscrupulous leaders. And you said for a long time, you had not been willing to go down that path, but now you agreed. So all I want to say is that you draw the line at 67, but in fact, in your work, you go back and back and back and back. OK, my question to Shlomo is a similar but inverse question in a way. Your analysis <laughs> is of a founding ethnos, which goes back to the constitution of Israel, the declaration. It hasn't got a constitution, I know. I mean, constitu constituting of it. Constitution law. I mean, the declaration of independence. Your book is astounding in the way it unpacks the emergence of a particular 19th century notion of Jewish <coughs> history which attaches it to the Bible and gives the people the claim over their land. So on the one hand, I would say that your analysis goes back also way, way before 1948 and to the problem of the constitution of a nation. Your book is a critique of nationalism, let's be fair. OK, on the other hand, it does seem that the worst of what you describe is post-67. There's a wonderful moment in your book where you say, only with the Bible in one hand and the notion of ancestral belonging in the other could Israel feel it had a right to the occupied territories. So I just feel that there's a kind of tension, wonderful sort of perhaps creative blurring of the lines between 48 and 67 in both of your thinking. And I'd love to hear you talk more about it. Well, uh, thank you. That's um, a brilliant commentary <laughs> on my work and on Good. tensions in, in my work. Um, and I'm getting their approval. My, my, 
Uh, and my answer to you is that Israel was created in 1948, not in 1917. In 1917, Britain issued the Balfour Declaration and it, uh, to, um, offering support for the creation of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Britain had no business offering the land of the Palestinians to another people, to foreigners, to outsiders. It was a deeply colonialist document and a very contradictory document because there is no such a concept of a national home for a people under international law. This is a very brief uh, passage, the Balfour Declaration, but it caused no end of um, misery uh, to the Palestinians because in 1917 the Jews were less than 10 percent of the population of Palestine. Since when does a small minority have the right to self-determination over the land rather than the majority? Then so you this are is a the British crime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is a British crime against the Palestinian people and there have been many more betrayals um, uh, of the Palestinians by Britain ever since. And the greatest betrayal ever s since the Balfour Declaration was Tony Blair. Yeah. Tony Blair, <laughs> who in my book Cheryl's is a war letter. criminal. Yeah. But Israel was not created on the foundations of the Balfour Declaration. It was created on the basis of the UN Partition Resolution of the 29th of November 1947. That is the Charter of Legitimacy for a Jewish State. Um, the UN voted for partition, um, one to turn mandatory Palestine into two states, one Arab, one Jewish. The Jewish agency accepted partition. The Palestinians, the Arabs, the Arab League rejected partition as immoral, illegal, and impractical, and they went to war, and they lost their war, and they lost everything. The Palestinians lost everything. Um, more than half of the Palestinian population became refugees, and the name Palestine was wiped off the map. So your argument to me is that really boils down to the UN partition resolution was unfair, it was immoral, and I don't agree, because it was a UN partition, it was a UN resolution, and we can't pick and choose. We can't be selective. We can't say, this resolution is OK and this one isn't. So it was the, ver the verdict of the international community. And I concede that it was unfair to the Palestinians. But I don't concede that what is unfair is illegal. So I separate the two. And I say that the creation of the State of Israel was unfair. It involved a monumental injustice to the Palestinians. But it was legal. And furthermore, and this is my last point, uh, after the guns fell silent, Israel signed under UN auspices armistice agreements with all its neighbors, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and um, Egypt. And Egypt. Um, these were the only internationally recognized borders that Israel ever had. And these are the only borders that I today still recognize as legitimate. Thank you. I think it's a very good, uh, I never asked this question, the difference between, the tension between 48 and 67. Now, as a historian, I think that, uh, you see, 48 was also a rape. I mean, if I don't legitimate the Zionist colonization till 48, and I cannot, <coughs> Because Jewish didn't come to the Middle East as good neighbors. They came to the Middle East as uh, people that want to build a Jewish state in an area that uh, was populated by Arabs. And they didn't take the Arabs, at least after 1929, uh, as a part of their uh, its state. You understand? Morally, I cannot justify Zionist colonization. What happened in the 40s is another story. We have the Shoah. The Western world decided to, uh, to throw the Jews on the shoulders of the Arabs. It was a much better solution for them, you understand? United States didn't want to open its doors to Jew refugees from Europe. 
As a joke, I can give you the example. It was much more historical justice to build the Jewish state in the Sudet. You know the Sudet? 45, the Czech threw away three millions of Germans from the Sudet. It was, for a moment, empty. <laughs> from historical point of view, it was very logic to declare a Jewish state in the Sudet. By the way, a very nice area. <laughs> really. But it doesn't happen. It was much more comfortable, what you say, the international community, to throw the refugee Jew to Palestine. Because in that time, somebody that didn't belong to the European, to the Western world, they didn't <coughs> consider him a lot in that time, before the decolonization, remember. Now, what is my position about 48 in the birth of the Israeli state? I'm a very moderate person, even as I wrote this terrible book. Politically, I'm very moderate, because I am for the two-state solution. <coughs> I think that the existence of Israel is a sine qua non for peace. Uh, I mean, it's a condition for peace. Now, in the preface of my book, I told a little story that I was invited to El Quds University. After the publication in Hebrew, they knew about the book because a lot of uh, Palestinians in the occupied territories, mostly the prisoners, know very, very well Hebrew. They invite me and I give a lecture about my book. <coughs> in the end of the lecture, somebody stand and ask me, after this book, how could you can justify the existence of Israel? And then I say, because the first line was occupied by a lot of girls with the, how is it? With the scar? Veil. Veil. And then I say that even, uh, even in the Muslim tradition, a child from a rape has a right to live. You agree with me, no? Then 48, was born a child that I think has the right to live. And I continue to insist that he has a right to live. But the problem is what happened in 67 opened a new perspective that this child that has basically a right to live can be a rosemary baby. <laughs> the young people don't know the Polanski <laughs> film, no? No, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Because what happened in the last years, in the beginning of the 21th century, that this state, with the Minister of the Foreign Affairs, Victor Lieberman, I'm really worried about the destiny, not only of the Israeli society, but also about the neighbors. A Rosemary baby, a state, they insist 42 years to keep another people under occupation without any political rights. The Arab Israelis are living in society with certain political rights, with segregation, as you know. Israel society without 67 is an ethnic a segrega segrega segregated. segregated society because a Jew cannot marry the non-Jew in Israel. You know it. You know it. But we, from 67, and this I'm finishing, it's something else. It's creating a real apartheid, yeah. a daily apartheid. We are destroying a population. We are destroying a people. And if the Zionist colonization gives birth to the Palestinian people, from 67, daily in daily, we are destroying a population. It's become unbelievable what happened in the occupied territories. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was very. <laughs> I'm going to open it to the floor in a minute, but I just want to say two things. Powerful as your analogy is, the child, baby of a rape has the right to live. I think there might be something wrong with it <coughs> because it is the rapist one could say, is the state of Israel. They say that expelled the Palestinians and took over the land. So by calling this the baby of a rape, you render Israel perhaps more innocent 
than it is. I say I think there's a slight hitch with the analogy, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But I'm a nice it. person, very moderate. Okay. <laughs> okay. I promise you, no? The second thing I wanted to say, but I think I'm just going to throw this out and then open it to discussion, which is I was fascinated that you said just then, Shlomo, that you are for the two-state solution. Because at the end of your book, where you talk about Israel as the nation of all its citizens, and you talk about post-Zionism, my sense was that actually you were advocating a one-state solution de facto, if not ideally. So I wanted to open up a discussion between the two of you around that question. However, I think it's much more important at this stage to hear from everybody else here. So I want to open it to the floor, please. Oh, hands, please. But I was going to ask about the two-state solution, so can you do it? Do you want to? I, want I think to I think the mic is coming round, and I think for recording purposes, you need to now put your question, your question in into the mic, please. I was just going to ask about the two-state solution. You know your position on it. I mean, it seems that it's getting less and less likely, anyway, at this rate. But it's still worth looking. You know, from a longer historical perspective, do you think it's possible? I suggest we take two or three questions and then come back to our speakers. There was a gentleman there who put his hand up, and here and here, and then we'll come back to the speaker. If uh, you could say who you are. Please. It's Jonathan Hoffman. Uh, we heard about your analogy of the rape. You said that on um, BBC Radio 4 on uh, Monday morning on Start the Week as well, and Andrew Marr did not challenge you. I challenge you. It's a disgraceful analogy. Uh, also, if one looks at, in your book, on um, page 313, one gets the following. To what extent is Jewish-Israeli society willing to discard the deeply embedded image of the chosen people? Now, that is a, a really nasty interpretation of the chosen people. The chosen people does not mean that in the Bible. It means people with an obligation, not people with a reward. And I've seen that used in an extremely anti-Semitic sense, and I would accuse you of doing the same. Uh, let's now look at your allegation that you're not allowed to teach uh, Jewish history in Israel. It is quite common in universities, in any university, for people in one department not to be allowed to teach in another department. That is plain. And you also said you're not allowed to write Israeli history. Well, you've just written Israeli history, so that's obviously uh, not true. Um, so now let's uh, um, look at your research. There is archaeological research, there is archaeological research, and there is genetic research which says, which says, which, which disproves your work. Archaeological and genetic research which disproves your work, Shlomo. Your work has never been subjected to peer review. Normally academic research is subjected to peer review, and your work is not. When will your work be subjected to peer review? And I mean historians, Israeli historians, which we've not had the whole week subjecting that to. Where is your respect for the truth? And where is your respect for your country? Thank you very You've much. made your point. Thank you very much. Donald Sassoon would now like to ask a question. Then the gentleman at the front here. We need the other mic, please. Oh, no, it's fine. Okay. Both of you um, are in favor of a two-state solution. I'd like to ask what are your views about one of these two states, the Jewish state. How Jewish should this Jewish state be? Because if you think that the Jewish state actually should not be Jewish, but should be, as you seem to be proposing, a state of citizens, of equal citizens, some are Jewish and some are Christians and some are Muslims, um, then what actual, what would be specific about the state of Israel, unless it is also a Jewish state? Okay, one more question, then we'll come back to the speakers, please. My name is Leo Falik. It's a question addressed to Professor Sanz. Um, I think, as uh, Jacqueline Rose said, your views go against the grain, but you are part of the Israeli academic world. You hold a chair there, and yet in this country there is a move to boycott Israeli academic institutions. How do you feel about that? Thank you. Okay, can we come back to the speakers now? <coughs> Shlomo, do you want He's older than me, uh, then I will give him the right to, uh, to start. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. Um, the first question was about uh, the two-state solution versus the one-state solution. I, I think the one-state solution is a very noble vision 
and I don't have any ideological problems with it. Really noble vision of our two communities living together in harmony and brotherhood. The problem is that it's completely unrealistic. Uh, the problem is that there is no grassroots support for this idea on either side of the divide. In Israel, there is no popular support for this idea. Just a handful of intellectual on the extreme left support the idea of a one-state solution. And on the Palestinian side, there isn't very much interest or belief in this uh, solution, whereas 70% of Palestinians are in favor of a two-state solution. So once again, it's a handful of intellectuals who, for very cogent intellectual reasons, support the one-state solution, like our friend, our late friend Edward Said. And in uh, my volume of essays, there is one essay on Edward Said and the Palestine question, in which I trace the evolution of his thinking from a one-state solution as the only just, fair solution to two communities of suffering, not aggressors, not victors and victims, uh, but two communities of suffering. Then, in 1988, for uh, practical reasons, he supported the PLO change to a two-state solution. Then, at the time of Oslo, he realized that the Oslo Accord uh, will not produce a two-state solution. It would not uh, produce a Palestinian state. So he came out against it. And I had a debate with Edward Said over the pages of um, the, new, the London Review of Books. I made the case for Oslo. He made the case uh, against Oslo. From today's perspective, it is cl clear that Edward was right and I was wrong. And towards the end of his life, he returned full circle to the one state solution as the only solution. But this is an intellectual exercise which is not relevant to the people who live on the ground and suffer on the ground. I think the only solution for them is independence and a state of um, their own. And Donald Sassoon asked, what kind of uh, Israeli state? And my answer is that I am very happy with Israel as a state for all its citizens. But if the majority of Israelis don't want Israel to be the state of all its citizens, they have to um, answer the question, what is more important for them? Once the Arabs become a majority, Israel can't be both um, Jewish and democratic. They would have to choose. And I very much fear that they would choose for Israel to become a Jewish state uh, and an autocracy. And that's when I'll part um, ways with the state of Israel. Thank you. I will be short. About the question, two solutions, one solutions, I insist that you cannot replace uh, politics by utopia. Politics so by? You cannot replace politics by uh, utopia. Oh. Utopia. Utopia. Yeah. utopia. utopia. Sorry, utopia. Utopia. I was young, I replaced it always as a leftist, you see, but I came maybe because of my old ages. I decided not to replace in political project utopia by uh, politics by utopia. Utopia has to direct politics. It's very important, but not to replace it. Now, the one-state solution that most of the radical British and Americans started to speak about it, I don't understand. For one-state solution, you, ha you need the agreement that, uh, of everybody, of the two parts. From two-state solution, to throw away all the Israeli army from the occupied territories, you don't have to ask them. I ask you to help to make pressure on Israel to go out from all the occupied territories without the agreement of the Israeli society. You don't ask the masters if to liberate the slave. You agree with me. You remember the liberation of the slaves? But it's not the master that has the right to liberate the slaves. But we are dealing with masters and you propose in them, you, with a one-state solution, you propose them to become, from a day to tomorrow, a minority in their state. 
Now, has Avi Schlein did morally, this is the right solution. One state. Politically, it isn't possible. But, and this is very important, I always am speaking about two states because I want the Israeli army to go out from all the occupied territories. But it's very important for the education, political education of the Israelis to stay, to say that we cannot have the position of Amos Oz that is saying that we have to divorce from the Palestinians. I think that this discourse of Amos Oz make much more stronger a Victor Lieberman. We will never be divorced from the Palestinians. We have to live with Arabs in the Middle Age. But it's a quite a different to propose somebody to become a minority. You understand me? Politically, it's not possible. Then I continue to say two-state solution in one condition, that it will be the two states started to build themselves as a confederation. Because the Israeli state and the Palestinian state cannot live really separately, completely. You have to understand. You look at the map about Gaza and uh, Cisjordany. It has to be a confederation. No, not a question. Okay, this is my position. Now, about the question of a Jewish state. I'm against a Jewish state. I accept the Israeli state because a quarter of the population are not Jew. It's clear that we cannot support a Jewish state like Bibi Netanyahu asks us. But in the reality, is is it Jewish? You know, my grandfather, if he lived today, he waked up and look how people are living in Israel, he will not think that it is a Jewish state at all. You understand? It will be a nightmare going in the street of Tel Aviv. In the beach, you know, going to the beach. It will be, oh, coming to the Tel Aviv University, you understand? Then I don't believe that today it's a real Jewish state. Only in the vision, in the imagination of the Zionists, it's a Jewish state. It's not at all a Jewish state. It's a kind of racist state. Don't insist that the state belong to an ethnic group, not to the society. But it's not really culturally Jewish from my point of view. You understand me, Donald? <laughs> now, it's Jewish because of the name. Now, the third thing, boycott. It's the worst question. I was afraid from this question, really. You make my life very difficult. Now, I accept every pressure on Israel to go out from the occupied territories. Everything is legitimate besides killing women and children. You understand me? I accept the resistance of the Palestinians. I accept boycott sanctions. You are, you know, in the Western world, they are thinking to put sanctions on Iran, but not about Israel. 42 years, any sanction because of the American veto. Yes, you know. I think that we have to do something because I don't believe that the Israeli society will really change from inside. I'm very pessimistic. But I'm not to start with the university boycott. And I will tell you why. Not because only that I'm paid in, uh, you know, my salary came from the Tel Aviv University. I don't think that it's a good place to start the fight, you understand? With military exploitation with the, some economic exploitation of the occupied territories, one thing is important. I cannot call to a boycott. You have to understand, because I am a part of this university. But I will never be against not sanctions and not boycott to force Israel to go out from all the occupied territories. OK? I cannot call it for it, because you know I am part of this Tel Aviv University. I was clear or not enough? No. I think not enough. I, think I cannot go for a boycott clear. myself. You, you can get up in Israel, propound these views, which I think, as Jacqueline Rose says, are against the grain. Jacqueline Rose, I think, would not want to hold discourse with you or other like-minded people within Israel. And this is what I cannot come to terms okay. with. And, and the rest of the UC 
Um, uh, uh, Ellie, no, not you see Whatever the university teachers call themselves. Okay, I think I better say something here just to fill in a little bit of. How about my question, Shlomo? Background. Why, why have you been Excuse me, could you please? You have to answer my question. Excuse me, I'm chairing the session, not you. Can you ask him to By answer the way, it's my right not to answer. Yes, it's also. His it's right. your right to ask, and it's my right <laughs> not to answer. Okay. <laughs> I, I would you just asked like me yes yesterday, the day before yesterday, I'm tired from you. Okay. In relationship to the boycott, I would just like to say that I am here participating in a discussion with Shlomo Sand. So I think your representation of my position might not be quite right. I have said I became a very reluctant supporter of the boycott. I have complex feet complex feelings about the boycott. I'm not an unequivocal supporter, and I've not been a central organizer of it in any way, and that was a misrepresentation. I was. My feelings are complex about it, and I think we should pause and allow for complexity of feelings in relationship to this. I am listening to what people are saying. Okay, you see, clearly don't want that to happen. I think well, it's, it's very, very true. important. On one point, one point that I would make, one point that I would make is that Shlomo has said an academic boycott is not the place to start, but nothing else is happening. Right? So then the question that he asked for economic sanctions, he asked for other activity and pressure against Israel. There is none. Right? There is none. We are waiting to see what happens with the Obama administration. So it is in that context that the question of the academic boycott <laughs> acquires a different set of meanings. That is all I would want to say at the moment. This is not about me this evening, it is about Shlomo. And Avi, I would like to take a second round of questions before uh, we have to close the session. There's somebody at the oh, there's so many questions that <laughs> Please, at the back there, and then um, over here in the corner, please. And then there's a gentleman here with glasses who I will take. I think I can only take three more. We're running way over time. Okay, please. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Gal Stiglitz, and uh, as a young Israeli... You have to speak up, please. I don't think your mic is on. As a young Israeli and Jewish, um, intuitively, I, I must say, I'm probably not agreeing with what you're saying, and I haven't read your books yet, but uh, I want to say thank you for challenging my, my view about my own identity. It's really, I'm really intrigued. And I would like to ask, to ask you uh, what you have to, what, is, what it means for you to be Jewish, and what is the vision that you see for the Jewish people? Thank you. Okay. There's a question over here now, please. Can you make your questions very brief now, because we are running over? Yes, I, I wanted to ask you what, uh, your impl what the implications of your work is for understanding the Palestinian people. You said you didn't think that they were direct descendants, as people uh, sometimes argued. Abraham Leon, very early on, uh, argued something like that. But if you're saying, if your argument is that there wasn't a mass expulsion um, that would then legitimate a return, I mean, how do we understand then the, um, the position of the, uh, of the Arab Palestinian people who were, you know, the peasants on the land um, for centuries beforehand? I mean, is there any implications from your argument for, for their position or their standing? I understand. Okay, one more question over here and then We'll um, have responses from Avi and um, Shlomo, and then we have to stop. Okay. My name is Antoine Rafoul. Uh, one question uh, to Professor Sand. Your book has been on the bestseller list for a while in Israel before it was published here, as you know. And I wonder, what do you ascribe that really two within the Israeli society, forget the press being interested in interviewing you. Is there like s such a thing as a, a silent moral majority that is waking up to the reality of the Israeli state? Or I didn't understand. Um, what do you ascribe you, the success of your book ah, yeah. in Israel? Is it, in my view, uh, that probably could be the silent majority, the moral silent majority waking up to the policies of the Israeli state. The other part of the question is to uh, Avish Leim. I'm very sorry to, to, to hear you say that you believe in the two state. One of them is in the West Bank. A simple question, what do you do with 500,000 illegal settlers 
and what do you do with the settlements there? All right, I'm going to ask um, Avi and Shlomo to respond now and also to take this opportunity to say anything that they really need and want to say before I, I bring the session to uh, a close. So if there's something you've been thinking, oh, I really want to say that now, please use this opportunity to speak. Very briefly, in response to the last question, I support an independent Palestinian state on, um, in the Gaza Strip and the whole of the West Bank with the capital city in East Jerusalem because I don't think that we can ask the Palestinians to make any more concessions. They've been making one concession after the other and getting nothing in return. The historic compromise was the Oslo Accord when the uh, Palestinians gave up their claim to 78 percent of mandatory Palestine uh, in, and they thought that they would get an independent state on the remaining 22 percent. So I have nothing further to ask of the Palestinians. I only um, expect Israel, I only ask Israel and hope that Israel would withdraw um, from the West Bank and allow the Palestinians to exercise the right, the inherent right to self-determination uh, that, uh, that Israel exercised in 1948. And, um, I would like the Israelis to end the occupation and withdraw from the West Bank, not as a favor to the Palestinians, but as a favor to themselves. Because it, as Karl Marx once said, uh, a people that oppresses another cannot itself remain free. Thank you. Sure. About Jewish identity, yeah? You know, uh, when I was young, I repeated always the very famous sentence of Ilya Arenburg, till the last anti-Semitic will exist in our world, I continue to be a Jew. I repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, and I become tired. Why? Because I'm living in Israel, and being a Jew in Israel is what? Being privileged. OK? Then I stop to define myself as a Jew. I'm Israel from Jewish background, Jewish origin, as you want. I'm not ashamed about my background, but I am Israeli from Jewish uh, origin, OK? It's very important for me. I'm not fighting against Jewish identity. Everybody has the right to define himself as he wants. I'm even not fighting against Jewish solidarity. It wasn't very strong in the 20th century, as you know. After Hitler, fighting against Jewish identity is stupid and criminal. After Hitler, fighting against Jewish solidarity is also stupid, in one condition. The Jewish identity will not mean to think that we have to be separate from others, not to let our children to marry non-Jew. I'm living in a state you cannot marry the non-Jew. Why? You can go to London to marry and come back. But in any case, you cannot marry the non-Jew in Israel. Oh, sorry. You are living in Israel? You can have a non-Jewish wife in Israel just don't get married in Cyprus, right? Ah, you understand? <laughs> this is, you see. I think you've just made his point. A long time ago, just I would say point. that it's very Jewish, you see? But today I stop with order, it. Order, order, please. You can't go to Cyprus or to London to marry, you know, because it's... Don't disturb me. You understand my point of view? Being in Israel today, as a Jew, is being a privileged person. It's clear and I stop too. I don't want to continue to be a privileged person. He's calling you a liar. I don't have to be sitting next to this guy. They oh, come to sit there. It, so it is totally it's unacceptable. So now, uh, be very short because you are tired with our, all uh, the conversation. The question remind me, uh, it was... Uh, implications of your work for understanding the Palestinians as a people. You see, Zionism didn't there. succeed to create a Jewish nation because most of the Jews don't want to come to Israel. It succeeded to create two people and two nations, the Palestinian 
people. I don't think that without the Zionist colonization in the 20th century, we could have a Palestinian people in a Palestinian nation. I mean, nation for me is a people that ask for sovereign sovereignty. To sovereign be sovereignty. sovereignty. If they create, Zionism create also Israeli people that they don't want to recognize it. The Zionists don't want to recognize the Israeli nation, you know. They treat the two people, the two nations as bastard. It's true or not? Now the implication is the fact that Zionism create a Palestinian people, a Palestinian nation that has the right to define themselves. But I don't think like Avi Schleim that the solution is only two states. I don't think that we are finishing the conflict by creating a Palestinian state. Because after the Palestinian state, there is also the refugees problem. We didn't pay from the land that we took from the Palestinians. I don't think that we can find a real solution to this conflict without the, the you know, declaring the responsibility of Israel to the refugee problem. I don't think that we can find a solution without resolving the Palestinian refugee problem. But don't forget that there is six millions, more or less, between five and six millions of refugees declaring, like most of the Arab leaders, without believing it, that uh, six millions have the right to return. <coughs> For me, it's not a solution. You understand? Because uh, recognizing the Israeli state, and recognizing the right of the return of Palestinians, is exactly a oxymoron, oxymoron, oxymoron. oxymoron, like recognizing Israel as a democratic state and recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. But you see, it's very important to understand. Without the responsibility, we didn't pay for the land. And I think for a real process of solution, Israel has to accept a part of the refugees. If I'm against the right of, of the return, I'm for real return of Palestinians. The children of Sabra and Shatila has to be accepted by Israel and we have to build in Galilee cities and villages for these refugees. Thank you very much. I just want to say one thing. The argument that Zionism created the Palestinian people is often used against them as a grounds for saying that they do not have any grounds for self-determination because they are a fabricated people. Let me just remind you that Theodore Herzl said, we are one people, our enemies made us so. Thank so you. this is actually a line of thinking that has run right through Zionism and does not discredit a people's right to national self-determination. Thank you very much. I would like to say that I think this has been a very extraordinary evening, not quite what I expected. <laughs> Um, the fervor and the passion and the intensity of both our speakers has been quite one of the most remarkable discussions I have <coughs> listened to, let alone chaired, um, ever. So I am enormously grateful to you both. I think there's a lot more to go on talking about. Please stay, buy the books. Our authors will sign them. Thank you so much for what has felt as your unequivocal focused attention this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you.